Good evening and welcome to Pioneering Progression, Joan Littlewood and Theatre Royal Stratford East. My name is Rob Watts and I work within the cultural events team here at the British Library. This evening we will be celebrating the life and work of the theatre maker Joan Littlewood and the place that she called home during her illustrious career with Theatre Workshop, Theatre Royal Stratford East. We will be looking into the impact her work had during her lifetime, her legacy with successive artistic directors such as Philip Headley, Kerry Michael and Nadia Fall, and her values and innovative ways of working, how they still inform the theatre world today. During this 90-minute event, we will be hearing from British Library curator Eleanor Dickens and the wonderful actor and theatre workshop alumnus Murray Melvin as they delve into the Joan Littlewood archive held here at the British Library. Current artistic director Nadia Fall will be discussing the Theatre Royal Stratford East as it stands today and how Joan's values still affect the theatre now. And finally, we will be joined by Deputy Artistic Director of the National Theatre, Clint Dyer, finding out what Theatre Royal Stratford East means to him. This evening's event will be chaired by Shima Pereira. She's a former print and broadcast journalist. She has written novels and short stories and freelances as a writer, critic and commentator. She is chair of the South Asian Diaspora Arts Archive, which collects and conserves the work of first generation British South Asian artists, writers and performers. So with that, thank you all so much for joining us. From all of us here at the British Library, we hope you enjoy this evening's event and it's over to you, Shima. Welcome to a conversation that I have been very much looking forward to. My name is Sharma Pereira, I'm a writer and broadcaster and I've been asked to talk today with two experts on the Theatre Royal Stratford East and the great directress, theatre person, innovator, Joan Littlewood. I hesitated there, Murray, when I said directress because I know Joan hated the word director. Don't suppose she would have liked director anymore, but this is Murray Melvin <laughs> and Murray has just donated an extraordinary archive of Theatre Royal Stratford East, 131 years of archive to the British Library. And he also worked with Joan at her theatre workshop. So we're going to be finding out more about that. And from Eleanor Dickens, who is lead curator of cre contemporary writing and creatives here at the British Library, we're going to be hearing about not just Murray's donations to the archive, but also some old photographs and the stuff that was already here. But Murray, we're here specifically because you have brought in this extraordinary collection of 143 boxes of programmes, letters, photographs. You tell me, pull it all together for us. Well, um, uh, I've been at this on a voluntary basis for 32 years, only because my lovely Avis Bunnage, who was we used to call her the queen of the workshop and um, we were great chums and she died suddenly and Philip Headley who was the artistic director was given an old brown suitcase full of Avis's programs and photographs and bits and pieces and said to me Murray we haven't got an archive at Stratford will you come in and, and, and sort it all out for me because it was Avis, I went in and I sorted it all out. Meanwhile, he put an advert in the Stratford Express that you know well, saying, Murray's back and he's going to do an archive. Now, have you got anything in your bottom drawers, um, old programmes that you're keeping? Will you bring them in to him? Let me reel you back a little bit there. So this is the Theatre Royal Stratford East. You've, by now, the theatre workshop under Joan Littlewood is gone. Philip Headley is the artistic director there. He's pulled you back in to put this archive together. How far did you go back to put I this archive together? I go back to 50, 56. 1956. 1956 as, as a dog's body, a student. I was their first person to be taken on as a student. I had a grant for a year from the London Cooperative Society which of course then had an educational programme. They don't have that anymore, do they? No, sad, sad. Um, and so I, I went as, and so I painted the foyer and, and did all the things. Um, 
Avis took me under her wing, queen of the workshop. But there was something about we got on very well when we were chums. And did um, you at that point know that the theatre had a history that predated Joan, or did you only find that out, or think about it, I suppose, once you started putting the archive together? Absolutely. I mean, I hadn't realised it went back to 1884. I hadn't realised that there was Italian opera there. Very successful it was. But you see, Stratford at that time was so different. Um, it was the greatest railway termini. And so it had to have workers. So it had, they had to have accommodation. So they built those little two up, two downs, no bathroom, outside loo. They went up very, very quickly because they needed the workers. You could draw a parallel to the National Health Service today. Um, we need the workers. And to get them, you've got to... Get... And so Stratford grew very quickly, very quickly. But there was no entertainment. And so one actor manager um, decided um, that they should have a theatre. And so we applied um, to build a theatre. Stratford Express said, and about time too. And the Stratford Express, we should explain, is the local paper on which I also worked, but not 131 years ago. No, no, no. Wait, wait, wait. Um, <laughs> so, so he applied and um, he got lots of objections, um, mainly from the church. The Reverend Pelly was very worried about a house um, for respectable gentlewomen. How long would they stay respectable if actors were unleashed? How long near would them? they want to stay respectable well, if actors were unleashed? They wouldn't have found them. They were busy queuing up for the gods to go and see them. Um, however, <laughs> however, uh, the local magistrate thought it was a very good idea and gave him permission. And as the Stratford Express says, and about time. They were really ahead of the game. And they've been there, the Stratford Express. Um, I'm looking at my short history of the theatre. All the way along, they supported, they supported it. Um, he built it in three months at a cost of £6,000. Wow. Remember. And what he did was, he already, there was a, a wheelwright's shop. And he bought the wheelwright shop and they built the theatre within the existing... What is the front of the house? The walls were very thick and very good, so they kept that wall. They knocked holes in it for windows and that became the front of the theatre. And so the theatre inside ran sideways down. Yes, it does, because you go down the side and the theatre's over here, isn't it? Right. Once you're in. Once you're in, you see? <coughs> yes. And, and so it was... Put the cost down. Put the cost down. Um, it was very successful, because we were into um, melodrama, of course, 1884. He took all the lead parts. And, and so he, um, he, he... Up to then, he'd been part of a what they called in those days a setup, a company uh, put on plays, wanted flats, they put on plays all the way around. And so he brought that company into the theatre. He took all the main leads. Um, he was very good. He put on a, 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 the um, Original, <laughs> the original review says they weren't quite sure what it had done to earn the title royal. But if that was to reflect the productions that he was going to put on, they accepted it. And he did put on very good productions. What he was no good at was money. And so within 18 months, he sold out to to the family who ran the setups of Wanstead Flats, and ah. they took over. 
So these were the theatres that were setting up and, and just doing shows. They buy this theatre for themselves and create a permanent home. Yes. And of course, everybody, what did they do at the end? All these railway workers at the end of the evening with their families. So they flooded to the world. And that's where it becomes, I found it became interesting when we got to the First World War. Now, if I can jump ahead to the workshop arriving in 53, two members of that, Anne and Oscar Tapper, went, they were the original archivists. They went to the Stratford Express because the Stratford Express every week put in what was playing at the Royal. And they garnered not only the, the dates, but the names of the productions. And it was interesting when you got to the First World War, you, what I found interesting, especially to today, when on Radio 4, I hear gentlemen of authority talking about the Third World War, you can trace by the productions, the patriotism because of propaganda that went through the country. Well, it's, it's... A mother's son, a lost cause, the child I will never see again. I mean, it, it's very emotional. Very emotional, and you see how the country. Um, uh, I, I found that very disturbing, and I find it even more disturbing today when you think, "Here we go again." Well, the theatre has lived through two major wars. Yes, goodness knows what's to come. Um, Eleanor, just tell me when this archive arrived. You, I think, live in East London, but did you know that there was this astonishing history behind the local theatre? No. So I, I live in Newham, local to Newham, um, and no, I didn't. I knew the theatre was there. I was aware of it, um, but no, I had no idea um, until uh, I came to the British Library, and this is actually my first job here. Was cataloguing Jones' archive. So we have two collections: the one that Murray's donated, and Jones' personal archive. Um, and that was kind of my first introduction to her, really. I mean, what an introduction <laughs> is well, I, her, you know, her collections. Yeah, I find it so fascinating. Murray, Murray's, um, you know, referencing the Stratford Express, which, of course, in those days, the local paper mm. is the place where you can find all that history uh, of a building. You know, you can check, you can check the facts. I don't know what the modern equivalent would be, but compared to many other theatre archives, is this quite comprehensive? Um... I think I think it is yes. I mean, I mean a lot of um, theatres tend to keep their own archives, obviously, so they do stay fairly complete. I think th the way that this one is magical in its comprehension is a what Murray's been talking about, how it covers the different companies coming through, but also how nicely it works together with Jones. So we have her personal archive as well, and so you kind of get the difference between what the theatre would keep and what would stay in a theatre and what would be in the theatre building to what. Joan herself personally thought was special <laughs> and took home basically yeah. and kept in her collection and then what they now do now that Murray has donated his amazing collection is come together in a really beautiful way and, and paint that picture. And were there any surprises when you were going through it? Um, yes I, th I think in, and for diff different parts for the different collections so I think what's really nice about Murray's collection is that it's brought together chronologically um, which isn't how we would normally catalogue something and it's actually kind of made me think a bit differently about that. So what Murray has done is kind of there will be a year, so 1955, and everything from those productions in chronological order is in, in the box. So photos, programmes, correspondence, and they just all come together so nicely that you get, you can just completely imagine that year and, and how it all came together. Whereas our normal process would kind of be to pull things out and have it a series of scripts and a, a series of correspondence and a series of photos. Um, so that was that was really enjoyable actually for me to see it brought together in that way and think that's a really lovely way of doing it. For Joan's archive I think um, it's a little different. There's often with archives one of the most magical things is gaps in them <laughs> rather than right. what's in them Yeah. Um, because that says such a lot about the person and particularly in this case where it's a it's a a personal archive you learn about that person by how they've chosen to arrange it and what's missing um and i think jones i, I think I, I said this to you when we talked about it before it has it's a bit of a love letter to her partner jerry 
um, and he looms very heavily in the archive. And for example, it's a very, very well organized archive until the point he passes away in 75. And then it's just chaos. Then it disintegrates. Chaos. <laughs> well, <laughs> it seems to me, actually, having been reading about Joan Littlewood and about the Theatre Royal Stratford East, that she has always been dependent, if I can turn, um, I can't think who said it now, actually, it's gone from my head, but, you know, it's not the, it's, it's always been, depend, she's always been dependent on the kindness of men, um, <laughs> because, you know, she had Jerry Raffles, who was her partner, who we'll come to, who was supporting her through everything, and subsequently, you know, here is Melvin sort of putting it, Melvin putting it all together. Um, for her, I think she obviously did have a, uh, an effect on blokes, Mervyn. Oh, but yes. Yes. What was that well, effect? Was she, <laughs> I'll take you back. You're jumping don't ahead worry. a bit. I'm jumping ahead a bit, but I just want a bit of... I know, I, I know. Of, you know. But, you know, we were at the First World War. Now, the theatre was open during the First World War, where it wasn't in the Second. Because all right. theatre, every place of entertainment was closed. But it, it went through the first. So you've got those names of all the productions through the First World War. But then when that ended, um, the country was, again, it reflects the country, was in a terrible state. You had the, the Spanish flu, um, just like we've got now. <laughs> Yes, it's so rather it's scary. Yes. It's the same that's coming. Um, but then it carried on. But then you see you got, and this happened to all the theatres in England, you got talkies coming in. And so talkies took over. Television came in, took over. All the theatres in England suffered because of this. Then you got to the Second World War, of course, and then it was closed. It was used as a potato storage. Oh, well, it was useful still. Well, absolutely, you see, it got a use. Um, um, but then, of course, films came in. Colour came in. Cinemascope came in. And, and the theatres all th through the country all diminished. Everybody stayed at home. And so... The royal, people took it over, tried something, failed, did no maintenance, just went in on short term. Um, you've got three really serious people um, who, who had a go. Um, you've got G. Rowland Sales, Evelyn Dysart. There was David Horne, who for three years took it back to its theatre times and, and, and ran very good programmes. I've got them all. Um, but at the end of three years, Cinemascope, the theatres just died. And he lost a lot of money, but as he says, he enjoyed it because it was a, it was a lovely, pretty little house. Um, so by, by the time that Joan Littlewood and her partner, Jerry Raffles, come across the theatre, what state is it in? Well, they did, the year before, Jerry was organising their tour. And just by happen chance, he telephoned the, the Royal to see if they'd got a week. This was the year before. And they were coming to an end because they'd run out of money. And they said, oh, yes, 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 we'd love to have you. So they came down from, their, from Glasgow and they did a week at the Royal. A year later, it was up for rent in a terrible condition. And Jerry had enough money for six weeks rent. And they took it. And they came down from Glasgow, found the Royal in this terrible state, and as I say, it was six weeks that have never ended. They took it on. Mondays were Black Mondays. The company did the roof, painted. Even my first job in 57 was to paint the gold filigree in the foyer of Matchams. That was my first job. 
because the curricula for an actor with theatre workshop was a little different from those establishments that so-called trained actors. Uh, Eleanor, when you were putting together all of the Joan Littlewood um, history, as well as the Theatre Royal, what is it to you that made the Theatre Workshop different? Um, I think, it, as Murray just said, about how at the time that Joan was bringing together the company, and also with, with you and McColl at the time, they had been a travelling company up until the yes. point that they settled in the Theatre Workshop. And it was their way of rehearsing together and how Joan was training the actors that was like Murray said, that was not happening in the UK. You didn't have a fixed company in the same way attached to a theatre. And so the way that Joan brought together and they were teaching them Laban, which is a, a style of, of movement and basing on um, Stanislavski, which now I think is probably, if you go to drama school, you know, for the past you eight years, that's, a, that's yes. all the core uh, curriculum. But it wasn't at the time, and that's not how actors were trained. Um, and it also, I think, is a mix of, obviously... At that point, it, everybody was still quite idealistic as well. Everybody in that company cared about it as much as Joan, so they were, you know, they were prepared to be living in the theatre, you know, not getting low wages, mm. training together, and it had that really cohesive kind of company um, bonding, I guess. <laughs> yeah, because you know you were kind of all in it together. Everybody was in the same position. Joan wasn't some sort of rich director that was, you know living a different life to them she was there in the theatre as well and I think that was very unique at the time that Absolutely. wasn't how other, any other theatres probably in the UK were working but it did become what most theatre practice after that point was based on you know it Sharma you think just what Ellen has been saying the two greatest theatre directors of the 20th century Joe Littlewood Peter Brook they both had to go to Paris mm. to be recognised we didn't recognise them. They didn't like them because they didn't, we didn't understand them. So they had to go to the continent to be recognised. Did she have a it. continental sensibility, would you say? Was that much well, more it, all it, 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 No, well, it, sta it starts um, with Stanislavski in Russia. You come down through Poland, Italy, Commedia, France, and the Trojan horse brought it in to England. And it, it stuck with, sorry, to, it stuck with Joan, I think, that treatment. Another thing that I really noticed in the archive that is really nice is that Joan notoriously refused a lot of awards and, and various, an OBE, for example, um, but she accepted European ones. So in the, and even yes. when she accepted an honorary doctorate from the Open University, which was in the 90s, she insisted on graduating in, in Europe. So it kind of shows that that stuck with her, even to that point, that she always felt like she really had to fight through the door in the UK, whereas in, you know, in, in Europe absolutely. they were absolutely yes. lauded, and she, you know, she yes. stuck to that. <laughs> well, she, she just loved our language, you see. Well, I'm, I'm interested in that, Murray, because you actually worked with her, you know, you were part of her team for a very, very long time. You were her friend until she died. So take me back to, to, you know, what it was like to be working as part of that ensemble and what was different about it for you because you were coming in. Yes, but then don't forget, I hadn't been to drama school. I, I, I was, you know, I, I didn't know. You were not ingenue. No, no absolutely not. And, and she loved me because she was just say, you were thrown out of school at the age of 14, which I was after the war, because I couldn't master fractions. And I never went to drama school. And she used to say to people, you see, Murray's a couple of steps ahead of you. He never had an English education and he never went to drama school. And I used to say at the time, And it wasn't until later that I realised that I had no parameters of what should be. I spoke dreadfully. I didn't know what you did theatrically. And that's what she... Cause so she trained me from scratch. And, of course, I'd had a pre-classical education. And so movement-wise which what is she loved movement was Joan. And so I picked up Laban very quickly, very quickly, because my body was already trained. 
and she loved that. She so that was movement and body language. And body language. And that's what, what um, Maxwell Shaw, a member of a, her company, said at the time. Nobody knew where to put her theatre. Was it ballet? Was it opera? It was, it was because it was some of everything. But it was, theatre was the main, she was political, everything was political, very political, but it had to be theatre first. Very, it was unique. And when you, when you use that term, what do you mean by theatre first? What, what differentiates it from any other? Oh, well, what, what is, well, Today they often say, oh yes, because working class theatre started with German. No, no, <laughs> that came later. You know, if after Joan uh, you had uh, unkept hair, you talked uh, with a Cockney accent, you became an actor. She wouldn't have that. She wouldn't have that. Her command of English was ginormous. I mean, whether she read all the books that she'd got. Well, she made you do quite a lot of reading, didn't she? Oh, as well. She, well, that was one of the unique things with Joan um, and Theatre Workshop. You studied the period. Maxwell Shaw, a, a member, said when he joined, he joined in 54, um, they worked on how the production was done originally. I was with the company, we did Sparrows Can't Sing in the Maxime Gorky in Berlin, where she had worked before. And when we were there, we were invited to Brecht's Theatre. He wasn't alive, but she was. And we said, um, are you coming to the... the oh, she said, no, no, can't bear those museums. It's a museum. She said, no, I've been invited by the East to lunch. Well, we said, lucky you. She came back from lunch in her sun-ray pleated skirt that she liked, dancing away because they had offered to build her, Joan, a theatre of her own and match the funding they gave to Herr Brecht. We said, wow, Joan said, this is wonderful. The next day we were going out somewhere. She, no, she had been invited to lunch by the West, who had heard about the lunch from the East. And she came back skipping away, saying, but they've heard, so they're going to build me a theatre and they're going to increase the grant that the East are going to give me. And of course, we, our faces all fell. And we said, oh, which, which one are you going to accept? And as often did with Joan, that face went from smiling thing to thunder. Thunder in front of you. Say, what do you mean? Which one are we going to, am I going to choose? I mean, it's, all, it's, all, it's what you've always wanted, a theatre of your own and, and, and money to... She said, yes, I know that. But she said, we've got the finest language in the world. And anyway, None of you buggers speak German, so what would I be doing here? <laughs> right. So East, West, so she the came, twain met. Yeah, absolutely. And so we came back to poverty. OK, so just let me take you back, because I've got to have a bit of fun here. I did ask you about her effect on men, because it does seem to be quite market, uh, you know, remarkable. What was it about her that you loved and that has kept you so engaged still with her legacy today? Well, you know, she was a queen, as she used to explain to us when we were doing Shakespeare. Kings and queens are made by the space you give them. She used to shout out, you're too near, get out. And you... She was the same. And, and she thought touching was... was giving in. You never touch. Because of Stanislavski, Laban, you have your cube. 
your space, your own personal space. You go through that personal space, you either go through it to touch, to kiss, or to kill. Otherwise, you never went through that space. You never went through Joan's space. She was like a queen. You never touched Joan. She, very, she sometimes touched you if you like, get on there quick. But you never, but she always, you look at the photograph, she has space around her. She was quite terrifying then. Yes. But that made her attractive, didn't it? Well, to men, obviously. Yes, 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 yes. 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 And so, and also, she had this, the timbre of this voice, which was seductive. Mervyn, I have to ask you about that, because I went and listened to radio interviews with Jane Littlewood, and I was expecting, because of her huge love of the working class, the fact that she saw the theatre in their everyday lives, that she wanted to reflect that in the work that you did, that she worked in an ensemble to create authentic work, using authentic voices and authentic stories. And I was expecting this little Cockney Sparrow to be talking to me, and there was this modulated, beautiful voice. Mm. And yet she was a, a, an illegitimate girl from Stockwell. How did that happen? Well, because, um, yes, she, she was that girl from Stockwell. Um, but she was trained by the nuns. She got, yes, she got a scholarship and, and, and went to the local convent for training. Now, you couldn't get all right that. <laughs> they corrected yes. your English. Huh. And so her English started... Perfect. It is beautiful. And, of course, she was highly well-read. Whether she had read them all, but she convinced you that she knew what was in them and she told you what to do because of it. But she was fascinating. Well, Eleanor, I also struggled to find a lot of photographs mm -hmm. uh, of Joan Littlewood and was so excited when you pulled out, just before this interview started, photographs of Joan with Jerry Raffles, which she was first with Ewan McColl, but then when she went to the Theatre Royal, she was with Jerry Raffles. The, the, the square in which the theatre stands is called Jerry Raffles Square. Yep. And she adored him. But you've both said, you know, how uh, after he died, really, that was, that was the end of it for Joan. And you've got these wonderful photographs. What, what else do you have that sort of gives us insights into Joan Littlewood, the person? Um... I mean, everything, every aspect, really. So th the photos, we have some beautiful photos, as you can see here. There aren't many personal photos of Joan or Jerry, just a few, which sort of makes them more special in a way, like them on their boats. They, they, Jerry was, loved boats. Um, I think, actually, of the personal side of her, we have diaries. There's 91 of her personal diaries, wow. um, which go all the way from the 40s and tell the day she died. She wrote it in her diary the day before she died. So they cover without any gaps. In fact, the only gap in her diary is when Jerry dies and she doesn't write it for a week. That's the mm. gap in that whole time. Um, there's also over 100 files of correspondence in the archive, so her personal and professional correspondence, which you can't really separate because Joan didn't separate it. So, mm -hmm. But everybody you can possibly think of that was working, she was writing to them. Um, but I think probably the diaries are the sort of insight into her personal thing. She's writing about her work, but also writes Is she about likeable? her life. I, I really like her. I mean, obviously, I never met her. Um, for me, yes, yeah, she's very likeable from the archive because I think she's a bit of everything. So there is that person that was at the theatre that was, you know, could shout at people and... Murray's famous story of being made to run round and round the theatre to get worn out um, so that he could arrive on stage out of breath. You know, there's that side. Yeah, there and is. then there's the person that wrote to Jerry Raffles every single year after he died on his birthday and described what she was doing and that she was, you know, eating a croissant and sitting with some flowers and thinking of him. Um, and she is both of those things. And I think, how can you not like that person? <laughs> well, they, she'd been together. He, he joined the company when he was 19. Mm. I mean, she was with Ewan, but Ewan went off and had affairs or anything that moved. Um, and, and so at 19, in came this, I, I've got photographs of him in, in those productions. I mean, 
a Greek Adonis. And he walked into the company, and of course, it's just. And they were together on and off for the rest of his life. And of course, when he died, she had realised just what a facilitator he had been to her. She did what she refused to let any of us do, was become emotional. She went totally over the top emotion. And we always said, well, she wouldn't let us do that. Well, that, that's, I think, why I was asking Eleanor, you know, whether she, that really about how likeable Joan Littlewood was, because when mm. I'm listening to her and reading her, she's such an intellectual, though she wouldn't have described herself that way, I'm sure. She's also clearly, by modern parlance, a director, in the sense that she's the person who makes things happen, mm -hmm. uh, even if she sees it mm. all as, as everybody having an equal say in what is happening. But there is very little emotion. It's all from the mm -hmm. head, in what in what I can see. Mm. So not not in, and I just sort of think, well, was she very nice? Because when people tried to be nice and to to actually showcase her genius, she wasn't interested. She was contemptuous of their wish to do that. Mm. And you know, you saying she loved European awards, but eschewed her awards in the UK, which is where she wanted to be because English was the finest language. She's a really contrarian human being. Oh, she was. Total. <laughs> Total. Avis Bunnett used to say, she said to me one day, um, you know, you'd be a better, better actress if you read more. So Avis went off and, and the next production, Avis dug into all the... Blah, 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 and they were in rehearsal one day and Avis said, oh, listen, and so and so and so, and, and Joan said, where did you get all that stuff from? And she said, well, I read about it. You shouldn't read so much. <laughs> totally con. So tell me now, as we, uh, we're you know, in the 2020s, is the legacy of Joan Littlewood still with us? And is it still, very importantly, oh, yes. at the Theatre Royal? Or was it up to the point that you, uh, you were archiving the Theatre Royal? <laughs> Her legacy, as the British Library know, <laughs> I have not stopped talking about her legacy and why it is all important. Her legacy... Philip Headley, 25 years. Who took over after, after Joe. No, there were two short ones, and then Philip. Um, he did more black and Asian theatre at Stratford than any other theatre in England. And that's because she had black and Asian actors in her company. She never spoke about it. They were actors. Their colour, their what, well, it's got nothing to do with it. They were actors and, and she wanted them and used them. So Philip carried on that tradition. Diversity, now our, everybody Keyword. uses the word diversity now, was Kerry Michael followed Philip. Kerry was there for 13 years. Um, he was the diversity. He did, he did, he did um, Tommy, on, put Tommy on stage. That's the rock opera by The Who. By The Who. Who wrote an extra song for him in the show. And, and Tommy, you know, deaf and dumb because he saw his father killed, shot was played by a deaf and dumb boy who couldn't hear any of the music. Um, the RSC recently, last week, announced that, you know, their new Richard II would be by an actor who is physically, what is the... Person with a disability. Thank you, Eleanor. Got to get it right, otherwise I'll get, you do. I get a clip round the ear. Um, you know, so the effect, and as Eleanor said earlier on, here was Joan in Stratford, in this town that was, that was so poor, dilapidated in this building, to create what she did in that atmosphere, in that thing. It's just... Unbelievable. Well, it's, just, it's also unbelievable that it continued. 
long after she had gone and yes. presumably still does. We can find that out. <coughs> I think I'll be interviewing Nadia Fall to go with this and I look forward to finding that out from Nadia. Eleanor, I remember that also Joan Littlewood th talked about pleasure palaces and she was looking at the mm -hmm. pleasure gardens in yes. Vauxhall and it seems to me that even then she was a precursor of what was to come because of course if you just look at modern festivals which are not just about the music but about mm -hmm. learning things, doing things, different fields, different rooms, different whatever, she was way ahead on that as well wasn't she? Yeah, so one of, one of Joan's other projects sort of with the theatre but outside of the theatre was the Fun Palace. Um, which she began working on in the 60s and she worked with the architect Cedric Price um, and that was sort of connected to cybernetics um, and the idea was almost going kind of back to their roots before they had this fixed abode of bringing theatre back out into the streets and like you say that is we're kind of you'll be hearing in the past five years and now things like playable cities and um, playable architecture and that kind of thing is kind of becoming buzzwords again and thinking about how people interact with cities and that was exactly what Joan was doing in Stratford in the 60s and 70s and um, when they basically were going to bomb sites and clearing them out and turning them into playgrounds for the local children mm -hmm. um, you know and I think probably quite relevant to Stratford today as well as it's being redeveloped and redeveloped and you know, yeah, very different. Stratford, Stratford <laughs> very is different sort place. of unrecognisable isn't yeah. it and yet the theatre is still there still yes, making its mark. Yes because Stratford is still two halves. Yes. Mm -hmm. That yes, roadway <laughs> divides the old and the poverty and then you get to the Olympic Park and the posh flats yes. and the posh people. Yes. It doesn't matter how much money you throw at Newham, it's always going to be Newham really, isn't yes. it? Yes. It's, it's, yes. And, and that really is what the theatre has historically anyway always serviced is those people who don't have the same access to the arts that perhaps those who live in the city or in the Stratford Olympic Park Absolutely. do. And had they have given Joan the O2 when it first started, they would be coming all over the world to it now. Mervyn, if you had to sort of say in one sentence, first of all, the effect of the actual edifice of Stratford Royal, Th Stratford um, Theatre Royal on you, Stratford East Theatre Royal on you, and then Joan on you. What would those sentences well, be? Well, she'd hate, I mean, she would hate me saying, but she did change your life. If you said it, she'd go mad. But she did change my life, the way I live it. Um, enormous influence. But you see, she came back, although they separated, got together, separated, got together. When Jerry had well, loved boats, and on his boat, he blew himself up and had terrible, terrible burns. And she was in Africa. And she flew back immediately to that hospital because they were still in love, no matter what happened. And she was back. He had started plans for something called, oh, what a lovely war, about the First World War. And he said, you know, are you going to stay? And the rest and is she history, said, or that rest is history. I'll, I'll do this play and then I'm off. But she stayed to be with him and she did Oh What Lovely War, which was to change theatre forever. Forever. And that, Eleanor, do you want to say a few words about Oh What a Lovely War? Because I presume you've got the posters and you've got the programmes I mean, I saw it at Central School of Speech and Drama in the 1970s, so oh a bit right. later. And I think I saw it with Dennis Quilly. Did I see it with Dennis Quilly somewhere? Could have been. Somewhere yeah. in the West End. Um, but you see, I never saw the original. No. We've, we've got some fantastic material on Oh, What a Lovely War. I think 14 boxes we were talking about from Murray's collection, which, like you say, has scripts and even things like the original sketches for the costumes, the lighting prompts. Um, even, I think, some of the props. So we've got some of the hats and the, the doll that was used. Oh, yes, Fanny Carby's doll. Yeah, Fanny's F doll. Yes, that always makes me laugh. Yes, <laughs> no, Fanny Carby, we used to have... Joan loved outdoor scenes. So that you came on and there was the sun and there was the flowers growing. 
Sarajevo outdoor scene. Fanny Carr became en poire, because she was a been with that as well, with a perambulator. And she used to go on about, Joan, Joan, I mean, there's, there's, there's nothing in my perambulator. I mean, no, no, no. she drove everybody mad, as Fanny Carby did, bless her. And in the end, Joan screamed, for Christ's sake, will somebody get her a dolly for that bloody perambulator? Stop going. And so, they made her a little dolly. She was perfectly happy. It, it went to France and it came to New York. Got back to London and um, I went to supper with Fanny and there on her mantel shelf was Dolly. I said, Fanny Carver, you've stolen that from... Oh, Murray, no, no, don't tell it. Oh, no, no. And it was always there, Dolly. And so I used to go and talk to Dolly every time. I said, how are you doing? How's she doing? Uh, and she was very ill. Got very ill very quickly. And I said to her, Fanny... I went one day and Dolly wasn't there. I mean, where's Dolly? Oh, Murray. Um, it's in the bottom drawer uh, in my bedroom, in, in my chest of drawers. I said, oh. She said, will you remember? I said, yes, darling, of course I will. I said, would you like Dolly to come home? She said, that would be lovely. And so Dolly came home when she, when she died, and I wrote a box, which is still there, Fanny Carvey's Dolly. I think one of the people who came to see Oh What a Lovely War was Bertrand Russell. Oh, indeed. On his 90th birthday, he came to Stratford. We hadn't, we, we hadn't um, been in the West End or we hadn't gone to France, but he came on his 90th birthday and he sat in the front row. And we were all told, of course, that he was coming. What a great honour. Now, he, in, during the First World War, Second World War, had been at Hyde Park every Sunday on his land. Speaker's Corner. Speaker's Corner. Haranguing the populace for allowing this war and the terrible slaughter that was going on. And one week, the mob set fire to his stand. They, they put papers and straw and things and set fire to it. Didn't stop him. However, he came on this 90th birthday, and at the end of the show, in the applause, Jerry got all the young ushers with armfuls of white flowers. They burst into the auditorium, they came right to the front, and they laid all the white flowers around him. Don't get emotional, Murray. They laid all the white flowers around him in recompense for the flames. We, of course, were all in, in, in absolute tears. And he, we thought he was coming, it was planned that he came backstage to meet us all. But he didn't, he suddenly disappeared, he went home. And the next day, he wrote a letter to Jerry, and Jerry copied it and gave us all a copy. Because Jerry did that sort of thing. Would you read it to us? There it is. <sighs> Dear friends, I owe you an apology for not having written before. I can only put it down to the recent activity concerning Greece and the death of Lambracis. And I hope you will understand. Your great kindness to me on my birthday was appreciated because it was from people from whom I have so much respect and whose good wishes are truly valued. I have enjoyed few things as much as Oh What a Lovely War, which I found moving and a statement on war such as I have not experienced. You were very kind to pay me such a tribute at the conclusion of the play. As you know, the First War was an event which 
had a vital place in my thinking and in my life. All the people concerned with resistance to war were my intimates. The great horror which affected us as the war interminably dragged on was something none of us have ever fully outlived. If there were any way in which I could make people understand how true and important your play is, I would wish to do it. I wonder it has been allowed on a London stage. After it, there was much that I should have wished to have said to you and to the performers I was fortunate enough to meet. To speak of ordinary things when I wanted to convey to you that I thought all that had happened to me that evening to be extraordinary. Oh, what a lovely war brings war within our grasp, which is immensely difficult. May you sweep through the world with this play, past governments and to as many people as authority permits you to see it. Please express my gratitude to all involved in the play. With my good wishes and respects, sincerely, Bertrand Russell. Is thank you, Eleanor. Well, thank you very much for sharing all of those amazing stories with us and memories, all of which can actually be accessed here at the British Library in the archive. Murray Melvin, Ellen Dickens, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Pleasure. Thank you. Well, it's great now to be joined by Nadia Fall, who is the current artistic director at the Theatre Royal Stratford East. Nadia, welcome. I've just been hearing from Murray, the legendary Murray Melvin, the history of the theatre itself. And of course, quite a bit about Joan Littlewood and her legacy. Of course, he was part of that uh, theatre ensemble uh, and he lives and breathes the Theatre Royal Stratford East. When you came in as artistic director in 2017, did that feel like a really big load that you had to consider as you walked through those doors? Definitely, it definitely did. I mean, it was this weird um, thing because theatre, I think, just is one of the art forms that lives in the present tense. You know, it can take you weeks, months, years to uh, cook up a play, cast it, work on the text, design it and put it up on its feet. But really, it lives in our memory. Um, we remember a production for whatever reason, hopefully because we were moved. And, um, you know, theatres don't usually have paintings and statues of bygone years. So uh, that's, that's one thing about theatre. But with Stratford East, it does have this history and undeniable legacy. And it definitely feeds into everything I do and how I think about the space and programme the space. Um, and it's inspiring really, but it was kind of, wow, that is a high bar, the history, you know, um, as you say, the living history through Murray and the first theatre to really put working class or everyday people's stories up on stage, which was a radical thing in its time. You know, there was very uh, little of that that was going on, maybe some at the Royal Court, but, you know, and the, during Philip Headley's years, the first to put black work and black stories on stage, and then with Kerry queer work. So, so it, it was really a theatre of the firsts. Um, and yeah, that's a lot to live up to, but it's also incredibly inspiring. Um, yeah, so well, we use those things. You're used to theatres with the word royal in their titles because you come from the Royal National Theatre where you've been doing quite a lot of directing. Was it quite a shock to come from the West End, which is rich and has a very sort of specific kind of audience? It, it's diverse, but it's very specifically sort of middle class yeah. to Stratford. I mean, as you say, you know, Newham is still one of the poorest areas in London. Um, that must have been quite strange. Small stage, completely different di direction. Yes, I mean, there, there are differences between, you know, the South Bank and the West End and, and the East End, for sure, and the geographical location, the community we, we live in uh, as a theatre. But, but 
actually, I was a freelance director and, and my background all through my 20s was really in participatory work, um, basically taking theater, script writing, making films, drama in, in all sorts of community settings like pupil referral units and schools and prisons and psychiatric wards. And, and that's where I sort of um, really uh, began as a theatre maker. And that's where my roots are. So and a lot of that was in East London, mainly in Tower Hamlets, sometimes in Newham. So actually, for me, the East End and working with people um, and not doing posh theatre was who I'm about, you know, and what I did. And, and when I did work at the National, you know, my favourite plays were bringing those stories to the National. But as a freelance director, I've, I've barely worked in West End theatre. It was all subsidised theatre, whether at the National or the Bush Theatre or whatever. It was, um, it was in, in theatre that is subsidised by the government and therefore we're able to tell stories um, of people and aren't just thinking about the bottom line. So for me, that 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 wasn't completely different. But of course, we we don't have all the resources that some of the larger theatres have, and um, but we still have a lot of um, experience and passion. And um, you know, I never want someone to be sitting in the auditorium thinking, "Gosh, they they this is a budget show." Um, they should be, you know, transported as if they were seeing a play in the West End or the South Bank or anywhere or, or in Sloan Square. You know, it should the production values, the storytelling should take you to a place and you shouldn't feel that you're seeing anything lesser than. And that is what we deserve. And that's what our community deserves. So for me, it wasn't spiritually, um, it was completely aligned to, 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 to who I am um, as an artist, but I can, I, I know what you're getting at. We don't, we're not, you know, we haven't got millions and millions to spend on, on each project, but we make a little go a long, long way. Um, I'm, I'm, I imagine quite a lot has changed since the days of Joan Littlewood when she could get her ensemble to spend one day a week painting and redecorating. Yeah. The whole building but I know that you did actually do quite a big uh about not about face that's the wrong word but a, a re rethinking of of the theatre and it looks very different now very modern actually and yet although although it is of of its time so when you saw that space I mean it's what Joan Littlewood did when she came in isn't it how did you feel it could be even bigger or better I just actually, it wasn't about bigger or better. It was actually going back to what, I was very inspired by Joan herself and going back to what she was trying to do and, and just sort of align it to, to the politics and the stories of our time. And, and just taking off the pain uh, and exposing the brick and writing Stratford East across it. It was very much in her spirit. She didn't care what people thought. She wanted to make a, you know, a passionate work that she could really be proud of and didn't care about, you know, appeasing everybody and, you know, the press or anything like that. And I just find that so mischievous and, and inspiring. And the thing is, you know, the theatre when it and we, we had the amazing knowledge of Murray, um, who gave us a lot of beautiful photographs of how the theatre was back in the day, which was very much like the way we've done it, take off, uh, taken off the paint off the front and exposed the brick and then put in quotes of Joan herself um, in the bar and really taken it back to its original architecture. So it was just to give it a fresh sort of, you know, put her best frock on while we opened a new season. And, and make it sort of feel, turn heads again and make it relevant to young people. So we didn't feel austere or posh or closed, that it felt like it was for them and the next generation, I want them to be able to walk through the door and not feel like, oh, this is an old building or a posh building and it's not for me. Um, it was to break that down in some way by, by taking off the paint and making it a bit like, I don't know, I was kind of inspired by New York and, and St. Anne's Warehouse and the way they, they'd done all of that. And we did it on, again, 
with, with our in-house um, production team. We didn't have loads of money for a big capital project. We actually used uh, a scenographer, theatre designer to, to, to help us. And, you know, uh, and the production team did things like put doors on the loo doors and make it artistic because it's an arts place, you know, not corporate. Um, so yeah, we very much stuck to the spirit and looked at old photographs and had Murray to sort of guide us. And it's a listed building. And I know I'm sort of biased, but I think it's the most beautiful auditorium in London. So yeah. It is, though I did complain to you before we started <laughs> about, about the seats in the circle. I shall go and test them again. One of the quotes that you've got in, uh, in the theatre is my, from Joan Littlewood, my life was built on the rock of change. So I'm sort of going to turn it around, ask a slightly pretentious question, which is that now you're sitting on that rock. Have you changed anything about the way that you think around theatre or have you honed it or have you tested it? Yeah, I mean, that was my way of saying, look, um, theatre is about change. Theatre is about the here and now. It's not just about deifying the past in the spirit of Joan. So I used the quote of Joan to, to say, I'm gonna change things for my tenure. And it's the job of every artistic director to bring their story, their passion, their stall, their artists, their people, and, and, and give it, their mark for their time and what a time it's been we've had the pandemic you know we've had huge political change and and uh the young generation everybody are restless um and there seems to be a huge gulf between those in power and the politicians and 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 the rest of us and it's not good enough and i think this kind of time of that's made us take stock and and um and really question authority is where the theater comes in. And it's a modern day church, you know, we come in and we make an audience, it's a modern congregation. And through sitting there, whether you're black or Asian or white, or whether you're um, working class or loaded, whether you're young, whether you're gay or straight, it, you know, we are in a congregation in the dark together processing a story and I think that creates an active um, physiological thing a in our bodies our heartbeats sync with the heartbeats of the performer on stage that's scientifically proven and we uh, we engage in the act of empathy and understanding each other and yes I might be different to you but you remind me of my sister and it's that human connection in that, that you know all these fascists tell us that we're different that tribe is better than that tra tribe this person deserves more than that person theater reminds us that we're very similar and brings us together and i think more now more than ever we need that and you know we we you know right we, we we've been doing that in our storytelling but we are challenged through the pandemic we are challenged through closures and and cuts in the arts and um but we're, we're, we're invigorated by the need to tell a story. It's quite interesting what you're saying about our political times. And, uh, you know, there is just so much discord. I mean, we're, we're doing this interview at the beginning of 2022. And uh, really, you know, there are, all, there are rumblings from, you know, the Eastern Europe. We've got post-Brexit. We've got post-Covid. There's so much happening. In Joan Littlewood's day, when she took over the Theatre Royal Stratford East, the, the vehicle was agitprop and ensembles and uh, sort of, you know, working together to create a message against authority or challenging authority. Now that we break up into so many different groups, is it harder to create that sort of theatre that is going to kind of constantly, that is going to challenge cohesively rather than challenging little bits? Um, I'm trying to get to the nub of your question. Yeah, me too. Um, listen, the theatre infrastructure um, calls, you know, for a lot more, you know, we have to, it's right, we have to pay people to make theatre and they deserve a wage and they deserve time and patience and, and to be taken care of. And, and so now we can't just go, can you paint that ceiling? Can you stay the night on stage and we'll sort it out? That we, we do, you know, have 
uh, a duty of care to our staff and our freelancers. So, so you know, <laughs> so it, theatre is very expensive to make and to do properly. And there's a lot of pressure on theatre now because arts uh, funding is so cut back to raise money through philanthropy or corporate donations, to sell tickets, to make a show commercial. So, so there's that going on. But at the same time as an artist, you wanna tell a story, you wanna, you wanna rock the boat, the cage, you know, shake it up and, and question authority. And, and it's very, very difficult to do all those things at once under pressure in a pandemic when you don't know whether you're open or closed, whether you're upside down or roundabout. It is a completely discombobulating time. I won't lie to you. But what has happened is that I've noticed um, that I'm able to do things like agit prop theatre in, in quick, fast ways that bring people together and get allow people to express themselves and their polit in the politics you know so you know we're unapologetically left-leaning we say we're revolutionary and we don't feel sick in our mouth when we say that we mean it and so one thing one silver lining if there was one of the pandemic was we had to work a bit more like we do on the fringe when we start out and when uh, the horrible murder of George Floyd happened we asked 15 um, global majority, um, black and Asian mainly, writers to respond to that, personally respond to that moment and made, and, and the theater's doors were shut, but we had a responsibility and a passion to respond and bring, bring our voice to it. So we did them as audio plays and then we put them on a, in a basketball in a court in Newham. And so there was a way of making quick agitprop political theater. And now that we're sort of opening up again, we're gonna continue with that. So we're doing a series called Burn It Down where six uh, writers um, get to write about a case of social injustice or uh, current affairs uh, that they're passionate about. And we make the play in a day. And because it's made in a day, we can have real luxury casting and people have an appetite I've seen to come in just for a play that's half an hour long and then talk about it and debate the politics in the bar. That is working alongside a musical we're bringing, which is very commercial. It still has pathos and politics and it's feminist, but it's a musical with pop music, with the, the, the writer of um, Girls Aloud, you know? So we, it's about breadth is I think what I'm saying. It's about the breadth of offer to make sure you always align the storytelling with the politics of the building. And, and, and the, so we would never do a play that wasn't about revolutionary ideas or leftist politics and socialist politics. W w that's not who we are. And, but we can do it in different ways is what I'm saying. Sorry, I don't know whether I answered your question, but. I wasn't sure at the beginning, but you certainly got there. So thank you very much because you also laid out for us the impositions, I think, of modern theatre making, which is that there was a time when you could just throw it all together and it could happen and you could you could be making theatre on the hoof. But actually modern times and modern expectations and, and modern technology actually means that it's all significantly more costly and more complicated to do that. And yet at the same time, what you demonstrated in your response was that Theatre Royal Stratford East is very much part of that Joan Littlewood legacy still. It, it's Nadia Fall now, but there's still that sort of burning desire to be taking on authority and breaking down tropes. Definitely. Thank you for saying that back at me because I, was, I wasn't sure where I was going there because there was so much I wanted to say. But yeah, absolutely. That's, that's our raison d'etre. That's why we're there. Um, and that's why we're in the community we're in. We have to be reflective of what concerns that community. Um, but yeah, it's not always easy because, you know, there are people, there are reviewers, theatre reviewers, critics um, that can make or break, I don't know whether they can make or break, but they, they feel like they can make or break a show. They feel like they can say this is a load of rubbish and uh, don't, you know, and then people don't book. It's that kind of pressure because, I'm not saying Joan didn't have it, uh, but our city is full of huge choice, artistic choice now. 
Um, and that's really exciting. That's what makes London such a great place for theatre, even in pandemic times. But because there's so much choice, you really have to believe in and have quality in what you do. And we want to anyway, but it isn't like, you know, you can see in every, any night, there'd be like 30 things you could go and see. Well, now that you are allowed back in the theatre, after a long time sitting on the sidelines and creating theatre in the street, um, when you walk up to that fabulous edifice, which now has this wondrous the statue of Joan Littlewood outside, one of the rare statues of women in this city, in this country. Mm. And you realise that you are the person who's running this. This is your building and your theatre and your productions. How does that feel every morning? Well, I feel like a mum. I am a mum. I feel like someone who wants the best for the theatre. I want it to shine. I want it to be a destination that everyone wants to go to. And I want the artists that work within it and the staff to feel like they have agency. Um, and that, you know, all I want it to be everything. You know, I'm, I'm ambitious and I, for it. And it's not that I sit there going, ha, I'm in charge. It's that's, that's, that's a fallacy. You know, the day-to-day -day running of any business, it's a charity and an arts organization isn't about one person. It cannot be, it's not physically or psychologically possible. It's all about the team, the team of people that work in the building and the team of artists and freelancers that we bring into the building. Because as you know, theater is um, as much about people that come in and do a show um, build it, design it, um, write it, as, as it is to people that, you know, are on the payroll. So it's about bringing those people together um, and in imaginative ways. And there's, and, and, you know, um, I am up at night worrying about the building and worrying about the next thing and how such and such person's going to cope with that and so on. But it's not just mine, it, it, it's ours. And, and I'm only here for the time I'm here to do the best I can for the building. And, you know, uh, and then it will be someone else's turn. And I want to leave it in a really strong place. Well, so. Nadia Paul, thank you for joining yeah. us and talking us through that. And thank you actually for, you know, enabling the gift giving of this archive, which is so fabulous to the British Library. Um, long live Theatre Royal Stratford East and its many wonderful directors, especially the women. Hear, hear. <laughs> Thanks. Clint Dyer is currently Deputy Artistic Director of the National Theatre, one of a very small number of people to have also worked there as an actor and a writer. His astounding list of credits includes starring roles in Sus, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, and on television, Black Mirror. With Roy Williams, he co-wrote and directed Death of England and Death of England Delroy. He directed Get Up, Stand Up, the Bob Marley musical, which is currently selling out six months in advance. Clint first dipped his toe into the theatre in a theatre workshop production of Things Ain't What They Used to Be at the Theatre Royal, Stratford East. It was the start of a continuing alliance and allegiance. It was at Theatre Royal, Stratford East, that he directed Roy Williams' Kingston 14, and The Big Life, which went on to West End success. This is Clint. Um, so firstly, thank you to Sharma. When did I first come to Theatre Royal Stratford East? So my first play that I did at school uh, that felt like a proper production. Uh, so I was at, in St. Bonaventure School um, that was about 20 minutes from Theatre Royal Stratford East. And we were doing a play called Things Ain't What They Used To Be, which is obviously a Joan Littlewood play. And I was playing Horace. And I got quite a strong reaction from um, the audience, which led to some of the cast members who were doing Theatre Royal Stratford East workshops, youth workshops, on a Saturday morning, recommending to me that I should go down there. So um, the, that, the Saturday after we finished, I think we did three nights, something like that. And uh, the Saturday after I went down to the workshops and we, we 
improvised. It was the first time I'd really embraced improvisation and I began to understood, understand what that meant in creating work. So it wasn't just about acting. What was wonderful about uh, the Stratford East workshop and the philosophy behind Stratford East was inherent in it was an element of creating your own work. That just the, the, you weren't just an actor that took somebody else's line and, and helped make their world. There was a, a, a definite line inside that where actors really contributed to the end result. And um, I found that um, highly engaging because it meant I could, it meant there was a possibility to politicize and, and have a proper um, interrogation of the lives we were living on the stage. And that is what Stratford East kind of meant for me. And I think it still has that at its core, but unlike a lot of theatres, it was really trying to represent the people that it was um, trying to also engage with. I, I, well, in terms of the art, in terms of theatre, um, well, you know, when I first joined, it was very, um uh white you know um i came from upton park and there, there was a, a a strong asian community and a strong west indian community that weren't being recognized in any of the theaters and stratford east in its desire to represent its uh larger community um it endeavored to put our voices on the stage um, so the, the cultural landscape was we were the only people that were actually doing that. We were the only we were the only we were the only theater that was allowing um, black black and South Asian artists, especially, to um, have a voice. There the, the were black shows, so the tricycle would be put on black shows, which were really American shows. Um, but none of the other theatres made it uh, part of their their gesture towards the people that lived in the areas they were serving. Oh well, it made it. It made my career without any shadow of a doubt. I, I look. I'm right now. I'm sitting in the National Theatre, um, uh, the deputy artistic director of the National Theatre. I never ever saw this coming. I think Philip Headley saw this coming. I think Murray Melvin saw this coming. I think many other people saw this coming. But I, for one, never ever uh, made this a career trajectory. But as an adult or an older adult now, I look back and, and I can see that that's what they were planting in me. I mean, Stratford, um, Philip put me on um, the board when I was in like, young, young, uh, early 20s. So it was obviously him going, OK, I want you to see what that's like from the other perspective. I want your voice on the board. Um, but he, he kept opening doors for me to be able to have a breadth of understanding, which would which would mean that I was able to, to take to even think about taking on a job like this. Well, what Stratford East means to me is a place where where artists have the chance to not only start their career, but be nurtured. It's a place that took risks on artists that weren't uh, what the, the, the commercial element of the business would think was a natural um a, a natural uh light you know i i think that we that it, it, and look the, the, in honesty the the landscape has changed dramatically right now it's completely different um you know in 2022 and post george floyd and you know there, there's a there's a lot of deeper thinking and analysis that's going into who we serve why we serve them um and Stratford East was a forerunner in, in that. 
we certainly wouldn't be here now, or we certainly wouldn't have examples where we can put put structures in place to be able to follow what Stratford was doing. Because uh, that's all that everyone's doing right now. You know, so so the, the amount of, you know, there's quite a few artists that have now been um, elevated into positions of influence that all started from Stratford East and just wouldn't have a basis or a proper understanding of how to take on those roles if it wasn't for Stratford East. Um, so, so that's a long-winded answer to a very simple question. So in short, how would you answer that? And I say, in long terms, how would I answer that? Sorry. <laughs> a highlight of me at Stratford East would be unquestionably the opening night of The Big Life. Now, it, it's a weird one because working for Mike Lee at that specific time in my career, you could argue was a, was a, um, was a bigger deal. Um, and it, and it, and it probably you could, yeah, it, it was a massive, massive thing for me as a young actor. Um, so by the time I got the big life, it was all a bit unknown. I was a bit unknown in, in directing. So I didn't have as much to lose in a professional sense because it was a debut. And when I did um, uh, It's a Great Big Shame, I had been acting quite a bit and there was an expectation and I was playing on the home ground and all that sort of stuff. So, there was, so it was nerve wracking. But the highlight still is the opening night of um, The Big Life because what Philip said to me was he wanted me to make something that my parents would love. And so what that suddenly meant for me was, of course, it would, I would always be making something that my generation would love and younger generations would love. So once he added in my parents' generation, it meant, oh God, this has got to be something that the whole of my community love. And there was something about working for Mike Lee that was uh, was very actorly, was the business, was kind of, you know, this is about my career, something, something very um, uh, centralising about how, how I would view that. But this, I had responsibility. And Philip had given me responsibility to make my community happy. And that's difficult. <laughs> it's difficult because there's so many different strands of, of expectation inside that. Um, because while you want to test an audience, you also want your, um, to entertain your audience. Um, and you also want them to feel good about themselves. And, and in one, one play or one musical, that's a lot to ask, to feel good of you, about yourself and test yourself as well as entertain, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, that, that's hard. And on the opening night, it ran for too long. Um, I did have to do a, 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 lot, a lot of cuts, um, but it was so epic. It was so um, itself. And the reaction was so um, heartfelt that people needed it. I really realized the power of, of theater because not only did people appreciate the show and all those three factors seem to be being embraced and held and, and, and seemed to be the truth, it felt as though um, something inside them had been answered. You know something, something that was missing, and and that was the point of theatre at that time for, for for me and for I think a lot of black practitioners. We realised there were so few pieces of of um, of uh, black work that it was essential to our being to to see our stories, and there were so few that when they hit the nail, it just meant so much. People were crying out and laughing at the same time because they needed it. And that was undoubtedly, will always be one of my biggest moments in my whole career. Because you just, you can't get that now. 
because it's regularly there you know regularly you know there's there's a there's a lot of work out there and there just wasn't um so there that's yeah uh, well i i think i think um well, well what i've been doing whilst whilst theater has always been trying to do this i think what, what with the way that tv has opened up our thinking and um because tv used to be much safer so you get the truth on the stage you could really really you know it was an artist's voice and then the tv would be commercial have an element of commerciality so that you couldn't really clearly be written by someone it's meant to clearly be the characters and the storyline theater means this is this is the writer's voice coming over so you go to see the writer's voice what i think is really happening now and is um and i'm hoping that i'm doing my work and it's part of the reason why we wrote death of england the way we wrote it is because we're really getting under the skin of characters and we're starting to um interrogate an interior dialogue that in a way and it's funny enough in the way that somebody like Shakespeare was doing so we're really trying to psychologically understand the motives of people so it isn't just about the story that leads them somewhere it's the why yeah in short I think the why is becoming much more um desired so it's a deeper intellectual deeper intellectually stimulating dialogue um from the uh play that's where I, th I think we'll end up going many thanks to everybody we've heard from this evening british libraries eleanor dickens murray melvin nadia fall clint dyer and our chair shima pereira and many thanks to all of you who have been watching from home this event has been part of our theatre series of events, and if you enjoyed it as much as I certainly did, please do keep an eye out for our many other events on the What's On pages at bl.uk. If you wish to view any of our previous events, you can find a vast array of subjects on our BL player. And finally, please do keep up to date with everything that's going on at Theatre Royal Stratford East at theatreroyalstratfordeast.com. Many thanks again, and good night.